Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here this morning and just to be able to worship together. If it, does anyone have a special announcement that you want to come forward and give? Okay, I'm supposed to announce that Bob Gipple is in the Wellspan nursing home and he has a um, hospital. Oh, hospital. Okay. He's in a, he has ammonia. All right, I had some announcements and I, it's in your bulletin. You know, I was thinking, every time I read this, it says refrigerator news. This must have gotten the name because it's food for thought. So let's think about it. Monday night, we're going to start the Bible study here. But those who want to go on the phone, you're welcome to use the same method that we did before. And then Tuesday is our executive committee meetings, commissions and board members. Wednesday, bell choir, sharing cupboard. I'm amazed how wonderful the sharing cupboard is able to reach many, many people. And here we are today, here. And you know what? I felt good this morning because Glenn and I were on the church uh, district board together. And here we are this morning on the pulpit together. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. So if there's uh, nothing else, we're going to hear our beautiful organ music.
this time we're going to have the call to worship. And then you have it in your bulletin so you can follow with me. Oh God, we gather together to worship you, the one who creates all things. We gather to worship you, the one who brings salvation through Jesus Christ. We gather to worship you, the one who sustains us by the Spirit. We bring to you our offerings of thanks and praise for all your gifts. Let us read together. We worship you, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Almighty God, from whom comes each good gift of life, we remember all talented mercies as we join in grateful praise for all your gifts to us and to our human race, for our life and the time and the world in which we live. Now you, you do the weekend. For the order and sustaining sustaining constancy of nature, for the beauty and the bounty of the world, for day and night, summer and winter, sea time and harvest, for the very joys which every season brings. We give you thanks for the work we are able to do and the truth we are permitted to discover. Good there has been in our past and for all the hopes of which lead us to on toward better things. We give you thanks as well. For all the joys and the comforts of life, for the homes and families and for our friends, and for the love, sympathy, sympathy and goodwill of persons near and far. We give you thanks as well. For all cultures, wise government, and just laws which order our common life, for education and all the treasures of literature, science, 
any little children in the church, you may come forward. Even if you're older and feel young, come on forward. Glenn's going to give a children's story. I'll imagine that you're all children up here. I want to tell you a story about Zacchaeus. The Bible tells us that he was a little man. And so one day Jesus was going along the road and the whole crowds were following him. And Zacchaeus wanted to see him. But because he was so sure he couldn't see him, and every time he tried to push through the crowd, the crowd would push him away and say, get out of here, you little squirt. And so Zacchaeus didn't know what to do. He followed along, but he really wanted to see Jesus. And so they kind of finally came to a tree and he said, that's what I'll do. I'll crawl up in this tree and then I'll be able to see him when he gets past. So he ran up ahead, crawled up a tree quick, got a good place to sit and knock and down. Sure enough, Jesus came along. But to uh, Zacchaeus' is surprise, when Jesus got to the foot of the tree, he looked up to the knees, and said, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus said, what? He said, come on down here. He said, why? He said, I want to go to your place and eat dinner today. So Zacchaeus was surprised but happy, so he crawled down the tree and went along with Jesus. And Went to, Jesus went to his uh, place, had fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy, <laughs> and all that good stuff, and had a good visit. And Jesus said, glad to be with you today, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus said, so am I, but I didn't believe you'd come. Jesus said, why not? He said, because people don't like me, and I didn't know whether you would like me or not. Jesus says, sure, Zacchaeus, I not only love you, but I love everybody. And so even whether big or little, God loves us. So all you little children, God loves you, and he wants to be in a relationship with you. So he loves you, and you love him back. It'd be nice if we had some children sitting here, but we don't, so we move on. <laughs> I think in the world that we live today, there seems to be a lot of stress and where sometimes people don't know how to handle that stress and I think we need to reach out to each other. We need to give what we can give. There's a, I think you all know there's an offering plate back there that we can give to that and I think uh, it's important that we do reach out to others and I have something here I'd like to read to you. It's found in Psalms 27.1. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I, be, shall I be afraid? You know the people who will be there for you. There's special family members, friends, neighbors, who are the first to ask, what can we do for you? With every kind and thoughtful thing they do, they are reminded to you that never, you're never alone. And whatever happens, they will not let you down. And I'm sure that's happening right here in our church. We're here for each other. But even more than that most faithful friends is your ever loving in God. You can lean on him at any time, any day and every night, asking him for strength, courage and increased faith, or just a whisper from him to let you know. He's by your side, he's there for you. And if you need help, he's right there. Recall the many times his presence has embraced your heart let God lift your mind, mood, renew your covenants, Re he, to be there to restore your peace of mind. This month, take a time and a few extra min min minutes each day to remember God, strong, deep, and unchangeable love for you. Never, no matter where life has taken you, you, all, you can always go to him. Picture yourself in his arms because that is exactly where you are now. You are in God's hands. He is there for you. And I think of all the people that we have struggling. Reach, we need to be reaching out to you. Let's just pray now, bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, we come to you with a humble heart. 
Help us to be mindful that material things and possessions cannot always bring us joy. We know that joy comes from you, Lord, and we want to praise and thank you for that. Lord, when we are discouraged, give us faith. We know we can trust in you. During the difficult times, we must know you're there for us. May we remember those who are sick, those who cannot be out and about. We thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to have open doors for us to worship here today. Help us to be open-minded to what is happening. At this time, we want to pray for this lovely lady, this Stalsuit lady who has been kidnapped. I can hardly understand why these things happen, Lord, but you do, and you're watching over her and the family. We know your heavenly plans is perfect. Lord, just bless them in a special way. Let us be near you daily. As you bless many, we pray that we can bless others. And we want to pray for Glenn as he brings the sermon this morning, that it will be a blessing to all of us. Help us to go forward in love and that we can reach out to those who are hurting. These blessings we ask in your name. Amen. All right. We have the music with the belt choir, but they're not here in person, but I understood it has been taped and we will be hearing it. Our next piece is Allegro Maestoso, and it will be accompanied by Barb on the organ. They really do a good job. I can't wait to be here.
ears for the beautiful music. I had a phrase that I had heard, I can hear the bells are ringing. I can hear the angels singing. At this time, Glenn will come forward and read the scripture and bring forth his sermon. Glenn, sermon. I'm going to be preaching this morning on creation and our scripture is taken from uh, first chapter of Genesis and the, and the uh, first three verses of the second chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be expanse between the water to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. So God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so, God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with the seed in it according to to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit with seed in according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God sent them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, and there was evening, there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kind, every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and, fruitful and increase in number and fill the water and the seas and let the birds increase in the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, wild animals each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant, seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that is fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens, the earth, were completed in, in all their vast array. 
By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been done, had, he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. When we think of creation, usually we think of it in physical terms. We look out and we see this majestic universe that God has created. We think of all the planets, all the moon, the stars. We think of our earth. We think of the majestic mountains, the Appalachians, the Rockies, the Sierras. We think of the oceans, we think of the lakes. We think of uh, the plains. We see the, think of the forest. We put it all together and we think of this majestic creation that God had made and placed us in. But this morning I want you to think of the creation in a different vein. I want you to think of the spiritual aspects of creation. When we open our Bibles, it begins by saying, in the beginning, God created. The whole idea of this world is God. God created. And so I want you to think for me a moment about God. Have you ever tried to imagine God? He goes beyond our imagination because he is so vast. But when I was in seminary, I had a wonderful prof professor by the name of William Beam. And he gave us this definition of God. And it's the only definition, and the only thing from seminary that I remember quite honestly. After three years, I remember this definition. God is the supreme being who in holy love creates, sustains, and orders all. Now, if we take that, we can divide it into three parts. The first part is a statement as to who God is. God is the supreme being. The second part is, tells us what his nature is, holy love. And the third part is what his, he does, his activity. He creates, he sustains, and orders all. So let's look at the first part. God is. That's a statement of faith. It doesn't say God was, God might be, God will. It states God is. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so we can't say, well, yesterday God existed, but he's not here anymore. Or he's not here now, but he'll come tomorrow. Maybe he'll come, maybe he won't. No, it's a statement of faith. God is. And then it says, God is the. The indicates something in particular. It doesn't say God is a God. God is one among many, like the old pagan religions thought. But it indicates God is the supreme being. If, uh, when we leave here, if I say to Lois, uh, I'll meet you at the car, she knows which car to go to. If I say, I'll meet you at a car, she might end up in yours if it's unlocked. So when we say the, it indicates something in particular. And so when we say God is the, we're indicating there's something particular about him. And what's particular is he is supreme. Now when we say supreme, it means he's over everything, over all. During the Second World War, we had a supreme commander by the name of Eisenhower. And uh, under him were many majors and uh, generals and lieutenants and sergeants and corporals and privates and all kind of men with different degrees of, of leadership. But he was the supreme general, meaning what he is that had the final arbitration of deciding what to do. And so when it says God is the supreme being, what we're saying is he is ultimate authority. And this basic authority is in terms of morals of life, how we are supposed to live. And so God is the ultimate authority of our life. He is the ultimate being, which means personality or uh, ideas or 
uh, who we are. And so when we think about God creating, he is the ultimate God who, uh, who creates us. Now that we, the definition also states something about his nature, holy love. We often think, we always think of God as love. We think of him as a loving father. When Jesus gave us his prayer, he said, our father, he didn't say our boss, or our tyrant, or our leader, or whatever. He said, our father, which is an indication of love. Our father, which art in heaven. And so we think of God as love, and the Bible says, in this is love. Not that we created God, but that he created us. And uh, the, the Bible says, God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son. So the ultimate uh, trait of God is his love for us. But it also has a definition of that kind of love. It is holy love. Now what does it mean to be holy? It means to be without sin. And so what it is saying, God is a sinless God, and not only is he a sinless God, but he cannot stand sin. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a bit later. And so the Bible goes on to uh, tell us how God created the world. It said, God said. Now the specific importance of that is, it's telling us that God had something in mind. When we speak, we, our words are expressing what we're thinking. And you know, sometimes we, we husbands especially sit around with a mood on our face and our wives might say, what are you thinking? I can't read your mind. And so what they're saying is, tell us what you're thinking. And so when it says, God said, let there be this, let there be that, it's saying God had something in particular that he wanted brought into being. And so when it came into being, the, the scripture said, he looked at it and said, that's good. And I think we could put a little more emphasis on God said, yes, that's what I had in mind. That's what I wanted to take place. And so if you notice this, there's a progression of, of, uh, of creation from the, from the smallest up to the largest, finally coming to uh, the creation of the earth and the creation of uh, we human beings. And it says something, every time God creates something, each day he creates something, he said, God said, that's good. But when he creates mankind, he says, that's very, very good. Because he created us in his image. Now, we can take, uh, we can take that to mean two different things. The psalmist says, when I consider the moon and the stars which thou hast created, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now we can take that to mean that since the universe is so vast and the moon and the stars are so great, here's this puny little uh, being we call man walking around on the earth. But it's, I think God is looking at it the other way because he says we are created a little less than the, the angels. And so we are looked upon by God as his highest creation. And we are created in his image. Now what does it mean to be created in God's image? It means two things, I think. First of all, we are created to be creators. He created us as men and women to propagate the earth. It is only through us that new life comes into the earth new human beings. This, after Adam and Eve, the only human beings that ever were born were born through other human beings. Even Jesus himself was born through a human mother at the direction of God. And so God has blessed us with this possibility of bringing new life into the world and being part of his ongoing creation. But it also means that we are to love God is love, and so we are to love. 
Now, the Bible has different words for love. It has eros, which means erotic. It has filio, which means family love. But it has agape love, which means that we want the best for each other. And so when God said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, what he was saying is, God wants the best for you, but he also wants you to want the best for your, for your neighbor. And so you are to treat your neighbor as, uh, as you would want to be treated. Now, there's another thing to notice about that. When he, God created mankind, he, he created us all in the image of God. He didn't say he created the white race in the image of God. He didn't create the black race in the image of God. He didn't create the red race or the yellow race in the image of God. He didn't uh, create Americans or uh, Africans or Asians or Europeans in the image of God. Mankind, all of us, are created in the image of God, which means that we are all to be held in respect by one another, regardless of our race, color, or creed. And so when God created us, he created us in his image. And so he created us by saying, let, uh, let this come to pass, and it came to pass. Now when we come this far, we come to Adam and Eve. And he, he said God created them, put them in the Garden of Eden where everything was perfect. And he said, you can eat of everything here except one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they said, okay. And so they set up housekeeping in the Garden of Eden, and they're going from day to day. Everything's perfect. Until one day Satan comes along. And he's kind of a sly old guy. And he says, hi, Adam and Eve, how you doing? Ah, we're doing pretty good. How are you? Fine. I see you have a pretty nice place here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything you want to eat. Yep. How, have you tried the watermelon yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Eve got a little juice on her, but that was all right. How about the cantaloupe? Yeah, we tried cantaloupe. I see a bunch of trees. Did you Have you tried the pears yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the peaches? Yep, very good. Have you eaten grapes? Yep. Yeah. I said, I see another special tree over there, an apple tree. Did you try that? And, no, we didn't try that. Satan said, why not? Looks pretty good. Looks delicious. Adam said, God said we're not supposed to eat that from that tree. What? Why not? Because God said if we eat of that tree, we'll surely die. Satan says, you won't die. What's the matter with you? You know why God doesn't want you to eat of that tree? No, why? Because he knows if you do, you'll be like him. He wants to have ultimate authority over what's considered right and wrong. And he knows if you eat of that tree, you'll be able to discern what's right and wrong. You won't need him. You can live life on your own. And so Adam and Eve started talking and says, hey, 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 that sounds pretty good. Eve says, I'll try it. So she takes a bite of the apple and, yeah, pretty good. Here, Adam, take a bite. So Adam takes a bite and, yeah, it's really good. But something happens. As soon as they do that, they notice something. They notice that they're naked. He said, whoa, what's the matter here? We shouldn't be like this. And so they went and they got some fig leaves and they covered themselves up and went about as though nothing happened until that evening God comes to visit with them again. And he looks around and says, hey, what's with the fig leaves? And they said, well, did you? He said, did you eat of the tree? Yeah, 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 it looked pretty good. He said, uh, who told you you were naked? Well, we figured that out ourselves. Now, what it means to be naked here means to be caught in a wrongdoing. 
I had an experience when I was about six years old, six or seven. Some of the kids in our neighborhood decided to have a party. And one of the girls, Annabelle Albright, bought some gumdrops. And uh, we went into our corn crib, it was empty. We had some crates and boxes there, so we sat down. Each of us had a place for our gumdrop, and she handed out the game gumdrops. And then it was a time for dinner, so we said, well, let's go home and eat, and then we'll come back, and uh, we'll eat our gumdrops. So everybody left except me, and I looked at mine, I had a green gumdrop. That didn't look very good. I looked at Annabelle's, and she had an orange gumdrop, and that looked pretty good. So I took a little bite. Now, there's no way you can take a bite out of a gumdrop without it being noticed. And so after we ate, we all came back together. Annabelle took one look at her gumdrop and said, hey, somebody took a bite out of my gumdrop. And everybody looked at me and said, it must have been Glenn. He was the last one to leave. Said, no, it wasn't me. I was naked. In other words, I was guilty as sin, let's say. And everybody knew it. And there was no place for me to hide and I felt so embarrassed, so guilty. And I think that's what God tells us about sin. When we sin, we feel guilty. We know there's something wrong. Now, we might ask ourselves, what does, sin, what does it mean to sin? What is sin? Well, sin is, destru is destructive. If you look through the Bible, you, you'll find every time it talks about sin, it destroys. And it destroys in three ways. I figured out, and you could think of some more. But first of all, it destroys us individually as people. A couple ways. Can, it can destroy us physically. I had two close acquaintances who drank themselves to death. They died of cirrhosis of the liver. One of them was a, my ro a roommate and called from college. The other was a member of our extended family. Now, the medical science would say they had a disease, a disease of alcoholism. But according to the Bible, it's a sin because they destroyed themselves. Another way to sin, or what sin does and how it destroys us, is our relationships. When you think of all the spousal abuses, all the child abuse, all the drunken accidents, all the things that's happened that harm and destroy people, that's sinful. No, we don't call it sinful. We call it alcoholism, or we call it abuse, or we we have some other name for it. But in biblical sense, it's sin because it destroys. And so God has said, don't do this because you'll destroy. A third way that sin destroys us, and we don't think of it this way, is nature. Some time ago, maybe you saw in the paper that a well, a dead well was washed up on the shore of one of the oceans. And when they cut it open, they found that its stomach was filled with all kind of garbage, uh, plastic bottles, boxes, cans, and it killed this whale because it ate this stuff. And people, uh, people are telling us now that the ocean is being overcome with garbage. People are just throwing stuff away. Now, we don't look at that as a sin, but in the eyes of God, I believe it is a sin because we are destroying something that was created perfectly. When God created the oceans and all his creation, it was perfect. There was nothing wrong. Now, it talks about different days. The Bible uses day in three different ways. One is 24-hour period of time. And uh, that's what we go uh, by pretty much, uh, 24 hours. We, and uh, it, you, you remember it says, uh, 
God is a, a, is the supreme being who in holy love creates, sustains, and orders all. He not only created the world, he sustains it, keeps it from falling apart, and, and orders it. In other words, there is order to this world in which we live. We have days, we have minutes, seconds, we have weeks, months, years, and there's so much order that we can order our lives. We know when we go to bed that in the morning it'll be daylight in five or six, seven hours, and we go to get, bed with that confidence because it's, uh, there is order in the world. And so uh, whenever uh, God created the world, he created it with order. And, and it, the, the Bible talks about three kinds of days, 24 hours. Second time is when an event happens. And so we have Flag Day, we have uh, Independence Day, we have uh, Harbor Day, we have uh, Martin Luther King Day, we have all these different days to recognize certain events that happen. And then we have religious holy days. We have Thanksgiving when we thank God for his blessings. We have Christmas when Jesus was born. We have uh, Good Friday. We have Easter. We have Ascension Day. And so a second day that we have mentioned day is to recognize different events that have happened. The third way day is mentioned in the Bible is to bring about something to pass God wants to happen. And I was trying to think of an illustration of that, and the best illustration I could come up with in my mind was the birth of a child. Each of you have a birthday. And what does that indicate? That indicates the day you left your mother's womb came squalling into the world. But if you look at it, that's kind of missed. Uh, deceiving because a birth takes place over a period of nine months, give or take a couple days or maybe weeks and sometimes a month. But the uh, mother and father get together and there's an egg that uh, is fertilized by sperm. We call that conception. And after conception, it comes an embryonic time for about five weeks. And then after that is uh, another period of time that uh, we go through development. Then we have the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And so the nine months of our birthing period is divided into trimesters. And we have different names for the different stages of development. But at every stage along that development, it is us. It's not a dog, it's not a cat, it's not a monkey, it's not a horse or a cow, it's us. And so when we think about a birth, we think about a period of time. And the Bible says that God does not view time the way we do. We view times in order of, of days and so on. But it says a thousand years in the eyes of God are but as yesterday. And yesterday is but a thousand years. In other words, in the eyes of God, time is irrelevant. He brings about what he wants to have happen. And so he has created Adam and Eve, put them in the Garden of Eden, and they sin. So this uh, it causes a problem for God. God has said the wages of sin is death. So Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, and death here means separated from God. God is life, sin is death. And so anything that separates us from God in our mind, thinking, or actions is sin, leads to death. But God doesn't want that to happen. He loves us. And so he has a plan. He, said, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son, and I'll let him die in place of them dying. They, they will be the sac he will be the sacrifice. 
He'll take the place of all these sacrifices that people have been giving over the years to cover their sins. And so here we see the greatest love of God, that he was willing to send his own son, have him die on the cross, so that our sins could be forgiven. And so when we look at creation, from the beginning of creation to the day we, we, our life on earth ended, God has been surrounding us with his love. And the ultimate love that God has is sending his son so that when we die, we are not separated from him, but we are with him. And that's God's greatest desire, I think, that he wants us to be with him. Our sin is no threat to God. Our sin destroys us. And so God doesn't want that to happen. And so he wants us to be obedient, not because we have to, but because we want to. Have you ever wondered how God feels about sin? Let me briefly say in conclusion, I think God feels two ways. One, one way is he's angry. But he's not angry at anything done to him. He's angry about what we do to others. You remember when Jesus cleansed the temple? He threw out the money changers and the, uh, the dove dealers. Not because they were doing that, but because they were cheating the people. And so God becomes angry when we sin in such a way that we hurt our neighbor. But I think the greatest feeling God has is sadness. And I think of an experience with my mother that illustrates this to me. I'm six years older than my brother, so when we were young, we were too big that we didn't fist fight, but we would scrap, you know what I mean? We would just bicker back and forth. And one day, Lowell and I were bickering back and forth and bickering back and forth. And Mother kept calling to us to behave, not do that. And finally, she got, became so sad and frustrated that with tears in her eyes, she just said, oh, boys. You know, that hurt more than if she would have paddled me with a, uh, with a stick. And I think that's God, how God feels about our sin. He may become angry if we mistreat one another, but I think it makes him very, very sad when we, uh, we don't follow what he wants us to do. One last story. I read this. You remember when God led the children of Israel through the Red Sea? And the Egyptians, after 10 plagues, left him go, but then Pharaoh sent out his chariots after them. And God opened the sea, they went through. The Egyptians followed and God covered them up and drowned them. And all the angels and the seraphims and cherubims there in heaven and they're clapping and giving each other high fives and dancing around. They're so happy because the Israelites were saved. And after a while, somebody said, where's God? And they looked around, they see, didn't, didn't see God anywhere. He said, let's go find him. So they all went down to the halls of heaven, finally came to a door that was closed, opened up, and there was God with tears running down his face. And he said, what's the matter with you, God? You saved the Israelites. You should be happy. God said, yeah, but I had to destroy 10,000 children from Egypt to do it. And I think what that says is, that God loves us all with an undying love, so deeply that he sent his own son. And what he wants from us is obedience, not because we have to, but because we love him and we want to do what pleases him. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, our Father, we come to you with grateful hearts for your love for us. And we want to love you in return, but we know that so often we fail. And so we ask for your divine forgiveness and guide us in a way that is pleasing to you. Help us not only to love you, 
but to love one another. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. What, no, what is it? <laughs> okay. Our closing hymn is 151. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Will you stand as we sing? His grace be with you as we leave this place. In his name we pray. Amen.